Welcome to the uh, 6 o'clock Rock Report, and uh, as scheduled right on time, Mr. Ian Asbury. How are you, sir? Good. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. I, I'm a longtime fan. So and I'm not. I'm not normally. I'm. I'm kind of. Oh, you know, bands come and go. But uh, right. I've, I've been following you for quite a while, and, Thank and you. Uh, quite an impressive career. Uh, you're in Calgary for two shows over the yes. weekend. Yep. Are you excited? Yes. I can see. Uh, I'm, pu- I'm not pumped for Calgary. Nice. Yeah. And a lot of it. This is uh, kind of music central for uh, the weekend. The Junos Absolutely. are in town. Yeah, I was thinking it was and, uh, strategically. Oh, sort of a bit of strategy going on there with that we, part. Will you check out any shows where you're here? Or you just sort of do your own thing. I don't know. I mean, I don't really know what's going on. I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a list of shows. Fair enough. Uh, who who's on tour with you now? What's the current touring lineup for the Cult? Um, Billy Duffy on guitar, original founder member. Uh, Chris Wise on bass. Mike Dimkich rhythm guitar. John Tempesta on drums. Been playing with this lineup for two years. Nice. I think it's our longest established lineup actually. Oh, it's yeah. the cult, cult Nine. The Cult Nine is that the, who the, knows? the nickname? <laughs> and, I don't know. Uh, uh, so well. Obviously, you're the the mainstay of the band, and Billy Duffy uh, are, are the most consistent members, yeah, correct? who cares? <laughs> it's really irrelevant. Nobody cares. Right. You know what I mean? Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, yes. Tell me about the new album. Where, where was it recorded? Um, it, was, it was, well, it's a long story. It started in the Himalayas. Then it went to, uh, in, in front of Everest. It's pretty much where the album started. Nice. I was touring through there with my girlfriend, Apollo, and... Uh, it's where Holy Mountain was envisioned. Then it was um, conceptualized in Vancouver. A lot of songs written in Vancouver. And then moved to L.A. and then to London. It's all over the place. Yes. Uh, and who, who was behind the, the boards in terms of... Uh, who was Me. Producer? You were the main man. Yes. Uh, I was the one driving force of this. It was like, for me, the, one of the things coming back to the cult in this incarnation was to uh, really just wanted to get more hands-on in terms of production and direction and... Um, you know, I got behind the desk during the demos and uh, really had a vision. I mean, I just want to strip the band down. I think we'd, we'd gone through so many things. We started off as an alternative band. All the money came in, celebrity. We got lost in that snowstorm, Sonic Temple period. Everybody still thinks I'm running around with long hair and cowboy hats. No. <laughs> Haven't done for about 15 years. And, um, and then we ended up back in kind of like the alternative rock ghetto uh, for many years. And... Um, you know, it just became sort of disillusioned, and part of the, the idea of coming back now is to get back to the original truth of the band, you know, and I really come from that perspective, so I really wanted to get my hands hands on in this record, and uh, I had a vision of what I wanted it to be, um, you know, kind of rhythm-driven stuff, bass-driven stuff. You listen to some of the tracks, the Little Rock Star, for example, is like a cross between Isolation by Joy Division and Rolling Stones, um, you know, Undercover of the Night. And it's just about getting really good breaks down, good bass lines, Peter Hook, kind of youth-style bass lines from Killing Joke. That's why we got to produce the record, you know, to get back to that kind of sound and um, just return to roots, strip it back. Nice. And, well, you've had, had the opportunity to work, work with a lot of, of great producers over the years. Uh, who do you think you took the most amount of le- les- lessons from in, ter- in terms of watching them? Who's the greatest producer that, well, that you've worked with? Who, who, who do you think were some of the... I think the best producer I've ever personally worked with in the studio is James Lavelle from Uncle. And the two tracks they did on um, War Stories, I think he's the best producer, hands down. So really the only producer that kind of like sat me down and said, you know what, I want you. I don't want the voice, I just want you. I want the emotion, I want that contact. Um kind of policing myself on this record as a producer, my, my involvement in this record. Um, that was a great experience. I think Rick Rubin, without a doubt. Rick's MO is to sort of sit and listen on an exercise bike, just sort of nod his head and, <laughs> you know, go back to Led Zeppelin 4, go back to, uh, you know, Back in Black and go, yeah, a bit more of that. Yeah. But now Rick would probably sit me down with, like, Johnny Cash and, you know, Leonard Cohen and say, I want more of that. So I'd, I'd love to work with Rick Rubin again. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you, it's funny because you see his name on so many great albums. Yeah. And uh, I always see Electric as is such a, a, a signature album f- for that tr- transition from love to, to sort of the, the next step. And it's so so nice and clean but heavy. It's just a, 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 a great album. And then finally people get an insight into Rick Rubin and, and, and 
sort of the workings of Brick Room with the uh, Dixie Chicks movie, where he sort of is pretty much hands off. He he listens and gives feedback, but not so much a, a button twist. No, but Rick knows to when when Rick drops a comment, it's a comment of value. It's just not some sort of arbitrary, you know, throwing something in there. He really is really considers what he's going to say. So it's just if you're open as a performer, you know, to take his wisdom. Right. Many haven't been. Sure. I love Rick. We, I've you know. I've, Every time I see him, I always see him in a record shop. He's buying records. He listens to music. He loves music. There's very few producers around like that. Of course, I mean, we should mention Bob Rock. We've got to, you know. Um, Bob's just like, you know, heart and soul, blue-collar Canadian, um, Anglophile. Great guitar producer. Really loves and understands guitars. Loves Mick Ronson. And that's really was, in a lot of ways, more Billy's kind of school. That was really what nailed that sound, Sonic Temple kind of sound. And, um, you know, I'm obviously the more sort of esoteric, you know, I'm the one that brings in the, you know, the uh, Jean Baudrillard philosophy, <laughs> uh, super cool. You know, I bring, I, I, I'm sitting in the studio, I'm like, well, actually, I want it more EQ'd like sort of Waters of Nazareth by Justice. And the engineer goes, what? <laughs> well, he's on the band, look at me and go, what's that? You know, I'm the one that sort of is on emailing Pedro Winter about sneakers. You know what I mean? It's just, I'm ahead, I'm down with the culture. So I try and bring that into the cult. And uh, it's not so much to be clever or modernist. It's really is, that's what I'm interested in. Nice. You know, hence we're at your station, which yeah. I requested. Oh, did you? One of the reasons that Roadrunner left is because they couldn't get us on, you know, modern rock. Yeah. They couldn't get us on alternative, whatever you want to call yourselves. I don't know what you call yourselves now. Uh, new, new rock alternative. Snobby music. <laughs> so, yeah, music for snobs. I, I, do you know what? It is? It's really weird. It's kind of like you've got that indie ghetto, alternative ghetto going on and so much inverted snobbery. And who is it this week? Vampire Weekend. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's a haircut. Mm -hmm. What happened to the philosophy? What happened to the, like, the real, really real? I mean, I'm talking revolutionary philosophy. What happened to all that? And it's like everything riding on the coattails of... I guess we've all been riding on Bob Dylan's coattails, really, all of us. So uh, I, I like a bit more of that. And that's what I was trying to put back into the cult and, yeah. you know, and bring some of that back and, and, and my solo work as well. Nice. We're gonna, well, listen, are you, are you okay to stick around for a second we play a song? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Dirty Little Rockstar, any, any story, any insight into the song before we play it? It's just really about the veneer TMZ culture. Don't buy into the myth, kids. All right, well, let's take a listen. We'll come back in a sec. We'll see you in Asprey from the cult. Oh, can I dedicate this? Oh, well, you absolutely I want to dedicate can. this to everybody at uh, Blink Restaurant, Andrew and Leslie. Uh, this is for you guys. Hope you're listening. Very good. Here it is. It's on X929. Calgary's new rock alternative, X929. That is music from the cult, Dirty Little Rockstar. And uh, across from me now, Ian Asprey of said band. How are you, yeah. Ian? Hello, sir. How, uh, you were just talking about that song as it was playing. Yes. And... Uh, Bef there was no guitar before, and then we started off with kind of a bass line and drum beat. It was like just, uh, I think it's just a rip off of Joy Division, to be honest with you. Well, not a bad band to rip off. Um, no, I'm, I don't know if you saw um, Control. Mm -hmm. Did you get to see that? Anton Corbin film. Yeah. Um, I really wanted to sing and still want to sing New Dawn Fades, and then I heard the version that the Killers. I oh, know it was Moby sang it with them, or oh, did Moby do that? The, yeah, it was shocking. Um, you know, and I really wanted to. That was my thing. Was said. I did did the doors. I would love to sing with the surviving members of Joy Division. Yeah, because I think I could nail that. How, are, do you uh, come across uh, the uh, Peter Hooks? And, well, Peter Hook you'd mentioned, but Peter uh, used to be around a lot. Pete was more of like the rocker in the band. That yeah. was his kind of thing. He had that stance, wide leg stance, yeah, bass worn down mm -hmm. low. Yeah. <laughs> Pete was always the rocker. He had a band called Revenge. Yeah, um, I think he's doing something with Manny. Okay, right now, and uh, from Primal Scream. Oh, yeah. Some trivia for you. There you go. Nice. Who's actually at our show at the 100 Club with Andrew Innes from Primal Scream. Sweet. Great fraternity. Now, I, I saw uh, back in the in 1990, mm. you did a, a, a festival. You were in charge of organizing Gathering of the Tribes in yes, San Francisco. Sir. Gathering of the Tribes. And a lot of people uh, credit that as being sort of the inspiration for... Everything. Yeah, Lollapalooza. No, everything everything postmodernist, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, you know, Lollapalooza, the Tibetan Freedom Concert... Blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, just it, my whole vision was like in the late 80s was pretty much that if you're in your 20s, you weren't getting a look in. It was all about Springsteen and, I don't know, the Stones and Eric Clapton and, you know, Phil Collins. And, I mean, even bands like, you know, NWA weren't being heard. Public Enemy weren't being heard. If it was, if it was urban music, it was hip-hop, it wasn't being played. Then you had the whole kind of like new age uh, wave of 
folk music like the Indigo Girls and Michelle Shocked and all that. Then you had all the rock and roll bands and punk bands, but a lot of the alternative scene wasn't really on the map. And uh, the whole vision was like try and create a Monterey pop style event with social political content. All the environmental groups invited Greenpeace, uh, Queer Nation. I mean, just uh, everybody was invited, Native Americans. And I mean, like the first band to say yes to it was Soundgarden. The original bill had Soundgarden, Ice T. I mean, you actually look at the bill now, half of those people ended up playing on Lollapalooza. But my intention was not to create a commercial event. It was altruistic. It was about the community. It was about advertising ourselves. And, of course, you know, somebody got hold of it and made a lot of money out of it. Right. Perry, Perry, Perry Farrell Farrell. bought his third house in Malibu, I guess. Yeah. And he's been living off it ever since, you know, um, all respect and love to Perry Farrell. But, um, you know, disrespect to me for not being a capitalist pig. Um, but, again, you know, it was, the, it, was, it was the foundation of all that. I ended up in Tibet. Just that's where I ended up. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't end up in Malibu. I ended up in um, you know the Potala Palace, um, having to chase off spy- Chinese spies. But that's another story. Chasing out Chinese spies. Yeah, I had a Chinese spy in the Potala Palace asking me if I had images of the Dalai Lama and what I thought China's policies in Tibet. And um, basically, if you if I said I have an image of the Dalai Lama on me, which I did have, I could have been thrown in jail. Wow. So. Uh, and, and not not a pleasant jail experience no. in that part of the world. And then there's a whole story with uh, the Beastie Boys and the Tibetan Freedom Concert and how they didn't want us to play it. And and I said, if you don't let me play it, then I will publicly embarrass you, embarrass you guys by telling you know going out and saying that I've actually been to Tibet. I'm the only artist who's performed at the Tibetan Freedom Concert that had been to Tibet. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, uh, if you're just tuning in, it's X929. We're talking to Ian Asprey of The Cult. And uh, you now call New York home. But for a long time, there's been a Canadian connection. You, you, oh, you, God. <laughs> a long time. But w- w- what is the Canadian connection? Um, romance. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> romance. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up in Hamilton. Hamilton, Ontario. Um, family. I've got a lot of family here. And and then produce some of the music in, in Vancouver. And Vancouver Washington. seems to be great. I mean, I think, you know, Holly Mountain was conceived there. And that's... Uh, sort of like the zenith of my writing right now and it's actually a jump off point for where I want to go in the future but it's, it's also I think Canada's probably a country that's embraced the cult in, in well a also you know way. what the thing about Canada is to me it's like Canada's in a cultural renaissance right now especially musically I mean it's unbelievable what's coming out of Canada uh, from Black Mountain to Feist to of Mon- well you know obviously Wolf Parade Montreal. Lady Hawk uh, Metric uh, Broken Social Scene and you know blah 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 Arcade Fire um, et cetera, no, et cetera. <laughs> you know your music that's great that's it's, oh, a, it's amazing the clicks yeah who are playing with us tonight for you, yeah who are a, you know an incredible band and uh canada's on fire right now yeah it's very nice and this weekend is the central do you want to stick around if we play one more song and sure. chat a little more absolutely all right we'll play uh, we'll go back to uh the album electric love removal machine it's the cult it's on x929 there it is that is the uh, cult love removal machine the signature mm. yeah Oh, yes. Are you, is it still in in use? Do you still do the? Yeah. If I have to, <laughs> that's that's sort of blues nonsense hanged over. Listening to like things like Muddy Waters, where they, you know, I I heard this Muddy Waters record and he's like playing along, do doing good doing, and something in the background shouts, "Take me with you when you go, man." <laughs> and I heard that and it was like amazing, just people shouting stuff off the mic because they're into it. Yeah. So all that like yeah and all that stuff just kind of came out of that, and Morrison's would interject with stuff like that constantly. Yeah. You know, you won't get that from your Vampire Weekend. <laughs> no, it's a nice. It's a good thing. It's kind of kind of raw and adds to the energy. Yeah. Um, you you're, you call Dude. you call <laughs> you call New York home now. Yes. Uh, and obviously, it's a, a big year politically, and uh, mm. you've never been one to shy away from an opinion. Uh, Politics. What What do you see in the future for uh, for the United States and, and just in generally politically? Well, they need a good public persona for the rest of the world. I think that they're gonna what we're probably going to see is uh, either Hillary or Barack Obama. And, you know, a lot of um, PR for the, you know, doing some goodwill out there. I think the United States really needs to do that. It's got a very bad world image right now. And um, I think they need to get the PR people on the, on the go again. But, you know, maybe a lot of social political stuff, uh, environmental stuff in a world stage, probably Iraq getting sorted out, Afghanistan, I don't know about the four and the Chinese situation in the Olympics, but it certainly, I mean, George Bush right now is going on about Tibet. He's, he's back in the Dalai Lama, so it's kind of interesting. It's very interesting. But again, you know, everyone talks about the United States. It's, I'm more interested in countries like Canada. 
because Canada has always been very much more consistent, liberal, you know, and I think countries like that, more modernist, liberal countries, are going to have more of a of an impact in the world stage. You know, it's not so much the glitz and glamour of the U.S. anymore. Mm-hmm. That's kind of gone because the credibility is gone. That's for sure. So it's more like intelligent, good speakers, and um, that's coming more from places like Scandinavia. The French president seems to be really good. Um, you know, it's more interesting in his wife than in him, but was it Scarzoni? Yeah. Yeah. Um, England, well, Britain, I don't know. It's just, I don't say about our British prime minister. It's, uh, looks like he needs to get on an exercise bike, but <laughs> it looks like Gordon Ramsay, actually. But, um, you know, I mean, he seems pretty cool, you know, um, Gordon Brown. But um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, personally, I'm more interested in, 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 in um, spiritual politics, where people are at philosophically. It's almost like a, a marginal thing, you know. It's almost like we've hit the wall. We've we've consumed so much. We're so far away from our real selves, our true selves, our expanded selves, our you know our spiritual selves. So I'm more interested in what's happening with with Tibet and what's happening with the Dalai Lama and what he's um, you know trying to share with the world: policy of nonviolence, racial tolerance, religious tolerance. Um, you know, turning inward for solution. Um, you know, disarming. Um, Engaging in, in dialogue and um, in a philosophical dialogue and spiritual dialogue and, you know, strategizing that way. And I think that's much more of a where we really need to be. So what else are we going to do? Get a load of politicians to move the furniture around? Yeah. You know, come in and redecorate with the same nonsense. But the, the well is dry. I mean, how much more can you extract from... It's empty. The barrel's empty. Yeah. So... I don't know. People, people are trying to print more cash. You know, the music industry. What have you got this week? Uh, MySpace. No MySpace music. The music yeah. MySpace music. Where's the music going to come from? Yeah. <laughs> and I suppose the executives are going to make it up themselves. Or I don't think you two and Madonna can make all the music in the world. No, as much as they like to try. You know, I mean, you know, Spin, um, Spin Magazine are uh, going to be a force to reckon with. I think at some point, um, Tom Hartle, Spin Media Corporation, very wise man. Uh, it's got some great ideas for the future model of music. More interested in songwriting and more interested in in putting bands like, you know, Vampire Weekend, who I, you know, do respect and admire. I was just using them as an example. I know, I was worried there. I was like, oh, no, boy, I'm just being, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm just, it's it's hard because they're on the cover of magazines this week. And with all respect to them, you know, it's 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 definitely their time and they, did, they deserve that slot. And they've definitely worked hard enough to be there and they deserve to be there. But, um, I think some of the older statesmen have got to come back. Bring back Bowie. I'd love to see what he's got to say about things. He's always been a, a charismatic and an yeah. ideas guy for sure. Trent Reznor, always on, on point. Top of things. Bono, always on point, and that's great. Yeah. You know, and and then you know things like, for me, like people like Questlove, on point, brilliant man, yeah. great vision. Um, that's my idea of being the supergroup. Him on drums, the RZA, Questlove. Uh, who would you get on guitar? I don't know. I'm trying to think. Now you're gonna hurt. You're gonna hurt Billy's feelings if you don't. Billy, say that well, way. Billy knows me very well. He's like, you know, if it was in a rock band, yeah, Billy Duffy. But in sort of like the, the world, do you know what? Who said that? Johnny Marr is an excellent idea. He's That's what? a great idea, Johnny Marr. Perfect. He's solid. Well, uh, a couple shows uh, this weekend at Flame Central. Yeah, Flame uh, Central. And not the other place. The big. Not the no more intimate show. Actually, yeah. it's, it's pretty sweet venue for for shows. It's it's. Very nice, Flame Central. I was just down there. It looks really good, and it's, yeah. it's oversold out apparently. Oh, so it'll be just crazy rocking. And and what? Yeah. Just before we before we let you go, there will be human sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, I'm right on stage. Mm. What's the breakdown of of uh, the, the older cult stuff, new cult stuff? Is, is it just sort of a mix of all of it? Well, if I had my way, it would all be this album plus bits of love album plus death cult, and you know maybe the eponymous album '94, but. Then it'd be like a load of, you know, crybabies. <laughs> There'd be like a pile of teddy bears in the corner. Um, so, you know, there, there's a, a good smattering of um, stuff from Sonic Temple, but um, it's a well-balanced set. I mean, I'm happy we're playing Spirit Walker, we're playing Horse Nation from the original period. So that's congruent with things like Illuminated, Dirty Little Rockstar, performing Holy Mountain, which is a, a solo acoustic performance, oh, nice. which is something I've never really done before. Maybe I've only done it like five times now. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, i um Really nice to have you down. Thanks for taking Thank uh, you. a chunk of time to chat with us and uh, check My out the shows. My pleasure. Ian Asbury from The Cult. We'll see you soon. Calgary rocks.